Hi, and welcome to another episode of UEN PD TV. I'm Michael Hackerinen, and today I'm really excited to be interviewing a special guest. We have Dr. David Strayer from the University of Utah, who set up the Applied Cognition Lab here on campus. Dr. Strayer has done a tremendous amount of research on the effect of technology and digital distractions on our brains, our lifestyles, the way we communicate, and most importantly, the way we drive. And this little bit of an extra long episode, we're gonna have a conversation with Dr. Strayer about what we can do as teachers, how we can be better role models as parents, and help clear the fog that exists in our lives from these digital devices. After this episode, I hope you sit down with your students, maybe share this episode with them, and have a conversation about what they need to do to restore balance to their lives with the devices they have in their hands, in their homes, and in their backpacks. Dr. Strayer, thank you for allowing us to meet with you today and come into your office. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's great to be here. Um, you've done a tremendous amount of research on the effect of technology in the hands of humans and the way we communicate, the way we feel about ourselves. And as educators, we're always pushing technology in the classroom and looking for ways to extend our teaching. What uh, are some of the conclusions you've come to with working with technology and children and, and, and digital distractions? Well, um, I guess what I'd say is that the technology itself is really not, not necessarily good or bad. It's how we use it. Um, but if we're not careful how we use it, it will become something where we become a slave to it. Um, if the phone goes off, you get to check it. If you hand an iPad to a, a child uh, in the school, uh, that becomes a real attractive uh, piece of uh, equipment and they'll maybe not pay as much attention to their uh, other classmates, to uh, the, co the coursework they're supposed to learn. Um, and so it may actually be, even though it sounds like the greatest thing to do, to put like some smart iPad in the hands of the kids may be exactly the wrong thing to do. And in fact, there are, 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 are uh, um, curriculums that do not allow the technology in the classroom and actually require the students to interact with each other and actually go outside and interact with nature uh, and get a first person experience uh, with doing science outdoors. From our kindergartners to our graduating seniors, it seems like every child is either exposed to technology or walks into the school with their own devices. Let's talk a little bit about our, our high school kids that are learning to drive, that are building their relationships with each other. Your Applied Cognition Lab has done a lot of research on the effects of a phone in the car. What can we do as teachers to sort of curb this epidemic that's occurring with distracted driving? Yeah, we're, we're basically a society that's, uh, that's distracted all the time. Um, and we surround ourselves with technology. Uh, I'm staggered by this statistic, but the average American spends 10 hours a day in front of a screen. Think about that, 10 hours a day. That's just, you know, there's nothing else that, that uh, competes with screen time. Um, and that's all, a lot of times kind of hollow, uh, vacuous screen time. Um, and so we need to be careful of that I think throughout our whole life, we need to be basically kind of being in charge of how that technology works and especially with children and high schoolers, they don't necessarily know how to make good rules and so that actually requires the parents to help set guardrails so that you don't go off and get crazy doing all kinds of texting or something like that or two or three in the morning. Um, when it comes to driving, we see that adolescents start to learn to drive 16 or 17, sometimes a little bit later these days. Um, but unfortunately, driving requires all of your attention and at the same time you have some kind of screen in the car, a, a cell phone, uh, and it's constantly competing for attention. And teens don't oftentimes make good decisions. So um, it is a recipe for disaster. Uh, and I see uh, cases just about every day from someone who's uh, lost a loved one uh, in some kind of a crash. It's because of a simple text. And more often than not, you say, how important was that text? And you go, it really was nothing. It was an advertisement. Maybe it was someone saying, hey, I'll be there in a second. Um, and so uh, if you talk to these people, they'll say, no text is worth a life. Tell us a little bit more about what you've learned in your lab 
um, about what's happening in the human brain when we text and drive. I've been fascinated basically since I started doing research on the brain and attention and multitasking. Um, and I first got interested in this long before cell phones existed, uh, looking at pilots, fighter pilots, and how they could be overloaded. Uh, and all those lessons that we learned about how you could distract a pilot apply to now just about everybody because there are more phones uh, and phone subscriptions in the United States than there are people. So just about everybody has one. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the question is what is going on when you use that? Uh, and in the context of driving in particular, um, what we see is that uh, uh, if you reach for the phone and look at it, there's the obvious distraction not looking where you're going. And that clearly has of sig significant consequences. But the hidden cost and the hidden danger is we think we're really good at multitasking and we're not. So when we pay attention to that text or we start to try and talk on the phone, we're diverting attention from driving to that device. Um, and it's kind of this invisible distraction. Other people could see you're distracted, but you might not even realize that you're distracted. And that's actually one of the big problems is that um, you may be you know, not even intending to be distracted, just a simple text, what's it going to hurt? And you'd go right through a traffic light or something like that. We're re really interested in, and, and my lab has been really interested in, what aspects of neural processing are affected. It seems like one of the big factors is the frontal part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, that decision making, problem solving, planning, executive attentional part of the brain. Uh, it gets co-opted by these uh, interactions with the phone, be it talking or interacting with social media and so forth. And even though we think that we're good at multitasking, that's just not true. And we've looked at thousands of people around the planet. And what we find is that maybe about 2% of the population are good at it. Those are the fighter pilots and people who can really kind of juggle a lot of things. But the 98% of us are bad at it. Our brains don't work that way. And so if you try and do two things at once, usually both things suffer. And if it's, if it's a context of driving, that means you're not driving as safely. What else can we do? And more specifically, what do you think we can do as educators? What's our role in stopping this epidemic? Well, as educators and also as parents, probably the best thing we say is be a good role model. If you expect your teen not to text and drive, don't be in the car texting and driving while you're moving them from point A to point B because they've seen something and they're gonna model it. I think that you need to have uh, and establish uh, really good principles and live by them to begin with, and that's the first step. You need to, in terms of uh, setting rules for your children, just make it clear, it's not okay to drink and drive, period. It's not okay to text and drive, period. And there's no reason and no reason to ever do it, and it's never okay or never safe. Um, and then uh, that message needs to be something that can be taken up by the schools as a whole. So the school can basically adopt a policy where we're gonna try and create distraction-free zones. Those distraction-free zones could be certainly in the parking lot, uh, but they could be cam campaigns that would actually get people to pledge not to text and drive. Mm -hmm. um, it could be in the classroom. Uh, a lot of times you'll basically have people who will drag their phone into the class and then just uh, sneak a look at it, check Facebook. Um, when I teach class uh, at the university, you know, I see a bunch of people, uh, students with their uh, laptops open, and I'm assuming well, they're actually, actually paying attention, maybe looking at the lecture notes or something like that. Uh, if you ever sit in the back of the class, you get a very different perspective on what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They're usually not paying attention to class. They're um, interacting with Facebook or social media. And not only, what's interesting thing about that in the classroom setting is not only is that person distracted, and that's obvious, but they create a, a zone of distraction around them. So everyone who's sitting around them is going, I'm paying attention to the lecture, or those, some, there's some cats playing on the screen or whatever the latest kind of fascination is. Uh, and so you actually can see uh, not only the grades of the person who's using the technology lower, but people who are sitting around them. So you create this zone of distraction. Interesting. It's almost contagious. Yeah. I mean, uh, the media is very uh, compelling to watch um, and designed to be fast presentation with uh, lots of colors and things that are designed to kind of uh, uh, attract our attention. 
to be very rewarding, to trigger the neurotransmitter dopamine that says, do that again, do that again. Um, and it's, uh, and it's, it's a very powerful technology. Um, one of the things you can tell about how, how powerful it is, is if you look, you'll see that a lot of uh, uh, people who work in, in Silicon Valley won't let their kids use that technology because they know that it's been designed to be used all the time so that people can't stop using it. What about in the home? Where would you recommend the distraction-free zones to be there? Uh, I think around the dinner table, I'll start. That, that's a place where you could actually go back and eat and have a conversation with everyone in the family. Uh, maybe awkward conversations, but at least it's face-to-face -face conversations. I think you need to be careful about bringing technology into the bedroom. Mm -hmm. uh, the phone will go off in the middle of the night and it'll wake you up. Um, we know that the light emitted from the phone actually affects the melatonin production and so it actually affects the sleep cycle. Okay. Um, and not only that, but it's just if you get some kind of message from you know, work or something like that, uh, it'll just, you know, you'll think about that while you're trying rather than resting. Um, with respect to especially kids, um, a lot of times the best thing to do is say there's a period of time when you can use that technology and then it's basically put in a closet or a lockbox or something like that. During periods of time, during periods of time when uh, they're supposed to be sleeping, let them sleep because if you leave the technology in the in the bedroom, it'll be used and they won't, the kids won't be sleeping. Then you have sleep deprived kids who are distracted, who don't, haven't learned some of the social interactions. We think that uh, interacting with people and the pro-social skills are, are something that's learned. You have to actually learn that by interacting with other people. And you can think about the technology as kind of a, a layer between you and me. Mm -hmm. um, and something's lost in the translation. And so it's, uh, I teach a class where uh, we actually take the technology away for about a week. Um, most people come back saying, wow, I had no idea that there were such interesting people in class mm -hmm. because they were forced to actually interact face to face and they realize uh, sometimes for the first time how starved they were for that kind of interaction. Wow. Let's talk just a little bit more about the teens. Um, the one dangerous thing with teenagers and young adults is they're in these adult bodies, but their brains, their frontal lobe, like you described, the networking part of the brain has yet to develop. It's easy to think that they know how to regulate for themselves, but they don't. I think you're right that uh, a good characterization of a, a teenager um, is that they have, for the most part, an adult body with one real significant uh, exception. The brain is not fully developed. That prefrontal cortex, the frontal part of the brain, uh, doesn't fully develop until about the age of 25. And so you see teens making really poor decisions, really risky decisions, engaging all kinds of behaviors that are uh, uh, either unsafe or uh, just unwise. Um, and it's in part because their brains really have not fully uh, developed so they can actually uh, suppress some of the real impulsive kinds of behaviors. Um, if you ever, as an example of just how, how truthful that is, look at your, uh, the uh, amount of uh, insurance rates that you have to pay. Mm -hmm. uh, they're off the charts when you're 16 and they start to drop down. So about 25, you start to see them actually level out. Those actuarial tables are actually mapping onto the development of that prefrontal cortex, the decision-making part of our brain. So you now put a teen whose brain hasn't fully developed uh, in front of a screen of one type or another, and you can't really expect them to make good decisions uh, as a, a, a parent mm -hmm. or as an instructor. You have to help them. Um, and you don't have to bully them, but you basically just have to create an environment where there are rewarding things to do that aren't always on the screen. And there's a real tendency to try and put screens into classrooms at earlier and earlier ages. There's a big um, dis debate uh, in the scientific field about how early uh, is too early to give the technology to kids. And they now have uh, toys that are toy phones that you can hand to kids who are one and two years of age so they can Pr pr pretend right. to uh, play on the phone. Um, and so uh, you just need to realize that uh, you have to help your the kids make good decisions because they will oftentimes just make poor decisions because they don't have the 
the neural hardware to completely make those good safe decisions. There are some antidotes to uh, over stimulation and over uh, over connectedness on the digital network. Uh, and I, I think that actually going outside, interacting with other people and leaving the technology behind uh, turns out to be uh, uh, one important way of reconnecting with the real world. Um, and uh, not only uh, can you do that uh, with a family unit, you can actually do it in the curriculum. So I know there are schools that actually will have the kids go outside and learn uh, in, the, in the playground or integrate uh, nature in one way or another into, uh, into the educational experience. Uh, our evolutionary history was not technology and social media and this connectedness 24-7 uh, with digital devices, but it was actually interacting with real people and interacting in the natural world, and we're just kind of flipping the equation. So you mentioned that these digital devices create a layer between people and their environment, but also between each other. Mm -hmm. How do you feel, uh, like, like the way we communicate by cell phones and by email, how's that changing the way we communicate in person? I think it, uh, in a number of ways it does. Uh, it tends to ch shorten and make our interactions more choppy. Um, like 140, 100, yeah, like 160 character, yeah. a little little sound bites, um, and oftentimes uh, things are lost in translation. Uh, it has this immediacy. So um, some of the apps actually, uh, if you don't respond within uh, you know a few minutes, it that that's uh, no longer useful to respond to. So it makes us have to immediately interact with it. Um, if you go to a, any restaurant and just look around, you'll see lots of times everyone around a table will be on their device. Mm -hmm. They may even be sending texts to themselves and they could have talked directly, but instead they're sending the text. You know, but I think the message should be, it's not necessarily the technology per se, it's just how we use it. And unfortunately, we've just basically opened up the box and said, go ahead and use it however you want. And uh, we're just kind of learning what the real guardrail should be for kids and for adults in order to be able to actually use this safely. Um, and part of my work in terms of looking at uh, driving uh, and, and operating a motor, an automotive uh, vehicle is that uh, um, you start to see that people don't know when to basically leave that technology alone and they actually start to interact with social media, call, text, do all kinds of things with that phone while they're driving and it's killing people and, and you know, it's just not okay. So this has been very insightful to hear about some difficult topics to discuss. Um, I think you're right that we are in a fog and we as teachers need to think about the best way to sort of push that fog out of the way and help our students learn how to balance the use of technology. And being a good role model is probably the first step. Um, we need to include our students and our children in this discussion and hopefully have a discussion in your classroom about what you saw today on UEN PD TV. Thank you, Dr. Strayer, for your time. It's been pleasure. a pleasure to meet you and to learn from you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks again to Dr. Strayer for his time and to everybody at the Applied Cognition Lab for letting us visit and see the research that they do. And I hope that you learned something new from this episode and have that valuable conversation with your students and your own children as well. If you'd like to learn more about UEN professional development, be sure to go to our website, uen.org register to see a full listing of all of our classes on instructional technology available to you. Thank you.